This is Festival Past Stories, a podcast series is told by the people who create and make festivals come to life. You will go behind the stage, kitchen, or studio door to hear the stories of passion and inspiration that started some of the world's most beloved festivals. Hear the startup stories and how an idea went from what if to what's next. Okay, friends, welcome back to Festival Past Stories, where we always take you behind the scenes. And today we'll take you as far behind the scenes as we can, because my guest today can't tell you how the magic happens. It's a rule in his business, because he is a magician, and there he appears. Well, he already appeared. So you see, <laughs> we're going to let him leave the magic to him. Uh, I won't be able to do that. I screwed up my first trick. But ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Hayden Childress. Hayden, what's happening? Hey, what's up, man? Not much is happening. Locked down, just like every other person. Yeah, just <laughs> another happy- brick in the wall, I see there. Uh, yes, you. yes. These are not real bricks. I'll let oh, you in. That's an okay. illusion. These, this, is, this is a backdrop. But <laughs> Immediately, we got into the illusions. Well, this is a backdrop as well. This is not my, wow. my wife. My wife is not very happy when she came home. I'm like, so I got the new wallpaper. Uh, and she's like, yeah, that's going down right now. So luckily, it is just... Green screen, oh. illusions, we need to do the See, we're all, we're all a little bit uh, of a magician at heart. So you are officially Hayden Magician Online. That's how the folks can find you. But we can, we'll get into that HaydenIsMagic.com, I believe, is the website. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. But look, you're also a comedian. And we're talking about festivals here. And everybody's dying to get back to them and all that kind of stuff. But... What came first? I mean, we're talking about, there's always these great comedy festivals out there. We've interviewed some amazing comedians who tell some unbelievable stories about the good, the bad, and the ugly of uh, being on the road as a comedian, as a magician. You're doing shows, you're on the road. But what came first, the magic or the funny? Oh, d- I definitely the magic. Um, and I'm first and foremost, you know, I'm not even... Like sometimes I'm even scared to even say I do comedy because I mean, my comedian friends are way funnier than me. I mean, I, you get rid of my cards or anything and I'm, I got like seven minutes of material top, you know? Yeah. My type five, I got a good type five. So, <laughs> type five. so uh, and I, and I guess when you, when you say you're a magician, just like when you say you're a comedian, if someone's I, a lot of, a lot of comedians when they're off stage, they're totally different people. They're like, look, it's just an act. It's what I do. But you tell somebody, I, my main job is an auctioneer. And I, if I tell people we're at a cocktail party or something, when people used to do cocktail parties and see humans and all that kind of stuff in person, they'd say, oh, you're an auctioneer. Say something really fast. It's like, if you're an accountant, am I like, ooh, show me a spreadsheet. How do you separate the columns? It's, there's certain things you do. I guess just in any performance act uh, out there, you tell people you want to do what you do. And immediately they're like, Show me, show me the thing. So I imagine as comedians get that, oh, tell me a joke. You're like, it doesn't work that way. Uh, as a magician, if you're at a cocktail party or dinner or something, do you just sometimes lie and say, well, I'm a, uh, I'm a, I'm a veterinarian actually, or because I imagine the people say to you all the time, oh, can you do a trick or can you show my kid a trick? Cause they got this thing at school next week and he'd be the star and he's not very popular and you can make him a star. Yeah, uh, I mean, I have. It was I've a lot. Had, I know. Had, yeah, no, I've had so many different versions of that. Because yeah, I mean, I used to, you know, starting out, I was so proud. I was like, yeah, I'm a magician. Yeah, yeah I'll do a trick, and then you kind of get known as. I would always have a deck of cards in my pocket, and you get known as the person who's. Oh, look, he's already got his crap there. He, you know, so. <laughs> um, uh, I'd say most of the time. Uh, it, de- it really depends on the scenario. If there's someone I need to go, like if I'm at the grocery store, some some bumps into me, I say, oh, I, I usually say, oh, you know, I work in the entertainment industry. I'm a yeah. producer. I say something like that. Yeah, I, mean, I produce shows. Sure. Um, I've noticed uh, sometimes people ask me what I do now, and I say, oh, I live stream shows over webcam, and I realize it sounds like I'm in the adult industry. Yes, uh, as we were referring to before. <laughs> so we're gonna keep teasing that throughout apparently but uh yeah so how can i how much is your webcam oh no no it's not that kind of webcam (laughs) right yeah so i mean so but i'd say most of the time you know the thing with magic is like yeah if i say i'm a magician uh it does feel really disappointing if i don't do some kind (laughs) of trick so i mean if i if i tell someone i do magic and they want to see a trick I, i almost feel like i'm letting them down if i don't do a light something so i will do it a lot of times and it's usually uh 
I usually won't carry a deck of cards anymore. Usually I'll borrow something from them. I'll do a quick mentalism mind thing. Um, Cause honestly I found those are the best magic tricks is when people came up to me and the, I, they didn't even think I was planning on doing it and it happened. Yeah, pretty much. But, but most <laughs> of the time, if I'm in a rush, I won't, but if I got time, I'm always, I love performing, man. So I'll always do something usually. Do you remember what the first trick was that you ever did? Yeah, it wasn't very good. It was, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was like <sighs> hard for me. So I've got a glass of water here. I'll just demonstrate. So it was like, I put a, I put a coin on a table and then I placed a glass like this on it. Okay. And then when you look down into the cup or through the glass, the coin disappeared and the way it was done, essentially you had a red sheet of construction paper and you glued a sheet of construction paper to the bottom. So when you did that, it looked like it wasn't there. That was the ah. first trick I did as a kid. It was, it's actually pretty deceptive. Um, I mean, it was in like a kid's magic book. Uh, <laughs> but that sort of gave me the confidence to sort of work and uh, learn some other magic. My, my dad had a deck of cards, like crappy souvenir gift shop playing cards. It wasn't even a full deck. They were all scattered. So I picked up a book on card magic. I just taught myself a lot of uh, stuff. So it magic can be a gift. Sometimes in the entertainment business, these things are handed down through the families, uh, even auctioneers. Like I got into this by accident and a lot of the auctioneers I know that this is the second generation or third generation. Other people are like, yeah, I got into it by accident as well. W was your father into this? Was it something that he did or was it just like to keep you guys entertained at home? Oh no, he didn't. Um, no one in my family has ever been involved in, anything show busy no theater no magic no comedy i mean my dad is an engineer my mom worked for she owned a marketing business i mean when i said we had cards i mean my dad was just like hey i have a deck of cards in my closet here he didn't know any yeah. card i think he knew one card trick but yeah so no no generational stuff in my family i mean i've talked to some magicians who like they're the third generation magician yeah. in their family which is which is crazy to me um but there's a guy I know, Sean Farquhar. He says, you know, my daughter can be anything when she grows up as long as it's a magician. Like, because his dad was a magician. And so, uh, but yeah, no, no. Yeah, I didn't have any relatives show me any magic. It just sort of came out of nowhere. Um, yeah. Your dad uh, pulled the cards out. He wasn't even a good poker player. People were taking him for money. No. So it wasn't <laughs> no, I mean, no, he just, and when I said he had cards, I mean, it was literally <laughs> like, Hey, Hayden, I got a deck of cards. Here you go. <laughs> that was his only trick. He pulled the cards out. And you're like, where'd those come yeah. from? And he then actually, you took it you from know, there. That's not totally true. He had one trick he did that was actually pretty cool. It was, um, you laid out a bunch of cards like this. It, it was a two-person trick. And he'd say, uh, okay, Jeff, turn around. I'm going to touch. Jeff, turn around. Stacy, point to a card. Okay. All right, Jeff, turn around. What card did Stacy touch? And, and she'd be able to know. It was that, it's really hard. Again, some magic tricks are very hard to describe, especially yeah. in a podcast form. But yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, I just realized anyone listening is like, what the hell did he just do? But yeah, uh, he, he did teach me one really neat one that I used to do as a kid. But like, hey, nothing, nothing in my family now. Oh, that's interesting. So has technology made magic better or uh, are magicians opposed to using technology with magics as like that just takes away from the purity of the whole craft? It is. It is divisive in the magic community. I'd say older magicians are vehemently against anything <laughs> that involves a phone or the Internet or anything like that. Um, I think technology has accelerated magic faster than it's ever been. I mean, we have communities online where we can come up with techniques with cards, put up a video and share it with other magicians who then, so there's a lot of sharing going on. We have access to every magic book ever online. Um, but in terms of, were you asking more like tricks that involve like, like if I did a trick on someone's phone, for example, yeah, like, look, there was always, when I was growing up, the magicians were David Copperfield and people like that that would have these big TV specials. And there was, I guess, in the community, there was probably controversy about that, how he made the Statue of Liberty disappear. Mm, yeah. And that was, I mean, there's definitely technology there, if it, even if it was lighting or, or 
green screen type of thing, whatever he did. But for those big tricks and for those Vegas shows, right, there's got to be lots of technology. Uh, but it's the main part is what you're doing with your hands, right? What you what you're doing, the the allusion to it, the uh, the sleight of hand kind of thing. So, um, what's your opinion on it? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of different. So I'd say you know with the the 80s and 90s era of magic, with it being on TV, the thing most people were concerned about was uh, camera trickery. They thought maybe these were actors, camera. maybe yeah. they they did some video editing stuff like that. Yeah, that, that was, was that was always the word. That was always the term they used. No camera trickery was used in this. Right, which which makes you go, mm, is there though? Like, yeah. I, I, may, I I think actually in a yeah, lot this of this guy it, doesn't need to be honest with me. These this this team of magicians doesn't need to be honest with me. Yeah, I exactly. Why would you they lie? Yeah. yeah, so I, I'd say with that, um, a lot of people did not like magic in TV back then because you know it looked it didn't look authentic. Um, to some people, I mean, it was entertaining, but I think, you know, it did lose a lot of people because they go, okay, that looks fake. You know, it wasn't until David Blaine came out with, uh, that's when reality TV really started getting popular with like cops. Yes. Uh, or cops on TV. So David Blaine looked at that and was like, what if we did that format, walk around with a VHS camera? We just went up to people in New York City and did a trick. And it was, rather than pointing the camera at the magic, they pointed it at the people reacting and they learned, you know, <laughs> It's like you can't fake that. Uh, so you're, it's like you're documenting this moment of in, uh, crazy stuff happening, and uh, that's sort of been the format for a lot of magic on TV ever since. Now, you bring up technology nowadays, where people get divided. Now it's all about Instagram and Snapchat magic. Um, okay. Because there's a lot of people you'll, you'll you'll see magic on Instagram or Snapchat it takes. You know, there there's a lot of criticism with it that okay, now that we're online, it has to be a 15 second long card trick, right? It has to be quick, it has to be snappy, flashy. Um, and the thing is, you know, when your camera is fixed, I can always stand at the, I can always get the perfect angle, right? <laughs> um, whereas in real life, that might be a little harder to accomplish. So um, it's divisive, I, you know, in the community, some people love it, some people hate it. Uh, but I think that will always be like that through time. Uh, I'm generally in favor of it. I think it's really neat, but I do think there's a performer for people in real life and perform for people over Instagram or some, it, it's just a totally different animal. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm not a 15 second Instagram kind of person. I mean, my stuff usually, you know, it, it's a journey. I think it's all about the journey between you and the spectator. Yes. And, uh, for me, it's always been about the relationship I have with the person watching, not necessarily, you know, hey, everyone, look at what I can do, right? Uh, that's just never interested me personally. But technology definitely helped at least keep the calendar full in the past year. I mean, I know a lot of comedians, they hated Zoom comedy and they couldn't get the whole thing to work. And even when you see now, like Jimmy Fallon finally has guests uh, in the audience. It's pretty much the roots and like as producers, but you would, you would hear like when he would do a joke, it would fall flat. And when he was at his house or it was just empty audience in the studio, but now it just, it just totally, all of a sudden you had a couple people there laughing and you're like, wow, that's live. That's just so much, so much better. But for magic, I imagined you guys had to pivot, of course, that magic word, so to speak from last year, uh, the, uh, word was everywhere. Um, the ubiquitous word of, of of pivot, but you had to do that. And was that a gr a good way to stay connected with your fans? Did you see the fans react well to that, and perhaps even grow your fan base through this? I would say that's a good question. Um, it so when virtual shows, when that all first started, I had the same reaction that a lot of professional entertainers had and i said that sucks there's no way anyone's gonna enjoy yeah. that um so for the first two months i mean a month or two i did my last i did like a corporate gig in march and i flew back everything locked down and for about a month and a half i did 
I was just waiting for June for things to open up. Never did. Yeah. Everybody was so, saying that. Everybody's like, let's just reschedule for June. And then all right, sudden, right. Yeah. It was like, like June and July. So yeah I, was, yeah, I was just rescheduling. And, but, uh, so at first I thought it'd be terrible. Then, um, uh, I actually had a corporate client who had me booked last year. They, they said, Hey, we really liked you. Can you do a show for us on zoom? And I said, I mean, I guess I could figure something out. And the first one I did was just on my iPhone and, uh, I made sure that the tricks I did were all interactive. There weren't any moments where it's just my wife pointing the camera down at my hand and I, Hey, look at this. Yeah. Neat. Right. <laughs> so, um, I learned a lot. I learned, um, like you were saying at first I told everyone to mute their mics so it wouldn't distract me perform. But I realized sure. if you don't hear people going, Oh my God, it, it, it's a really, <laughs> yeah. it's so it's awkward for me first off. Cause like I, I was so used to getting a reaction when I did the thing at this part, like right. the car disappeared, pause. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. There's none of that. So I, I started telling people, leave your mics unmuted. And cause I said, I want it to feel like we're all hanging out in person again. And that made a huge difference. You know, people clapping, screaming, you get, you, you know, your, your smart ass guy go, saying something to yeah. his friend who I saw it. Yeah. I saw him move his, move his, move his hand. It's in his sleeve. Yeah. Yeah. Come I mean, on. It's, it, it, but it makes it more, you know, that stuff like makes it real for me. Like, uh, uh, cause you know, I have, I have pieces in my show where I do a thing sort of to sort of get that guy to say something. Cause it makes it even funnier. Where he's like, yeah. It's in his hand. And you're like, no, no look, at, like, look in your hand, sir. And he's like, what, yeah, oh, my God, it's in my hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that stuff. Yeah. So um, I'd say, uh, I mean, I made all a, a lot of new stuff for my Zoom show. And um, the people who have been watching, like, only, God, like, yeah, people who saw me in the past couple of years didn't really connect with me on Zoom. It was a lot of newer people. Um, I'd say the only clients who did or only audiences who did were from uh, New York, New York City. Cause, and my guess is because New York City was locked down more. Yeah. So I think there's That's more. That's where I am of, right now. We're still, we're still a bit locked down, but we're opening up. Yeah, right yeah. So, I mean, we, right um, and I was, uh, my wife and I were in New York for a bit. We were planning to just make a permanent move. Um, but we're back in Charlotte, North Carolina now. And, you know, here it, it's halfway closed, halfway uh -huh. open. So people aren't as interested in this kind of setup, right? Because uh, to a lot of people here, they go, why would I watch a magic show on Zoom when I can just go to a bar with my friend, my friend? five friends max or whatever yeah, uh, with my that's little been the vibe my pod yeah i mean i, I knew i knew i wasn't gonna i did um a comedy variety show with a group here in charlotte and i was expecting you know all the people who've whatever my charlotte fans whatever i thought everyone would sign on and see it and i remember doing the show with them and outside just hearing people all partying outside at the bars that we live by Ugh. and i said okay, everyone's out there because everything's kind of opened up. So Yeah, and people couldn't yeah. wait. Yeah, you're right. I mean, so uh, the people I've really connected with have been from places where it's really closed down. So San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York City. Those have been uh, most of my places. And they're people I didn't even connect with before. It was a lot of word of mouth and they found me online. Oh, it's amazing. Um, so there's yeah. those positives that we can pull out of this kind of stuff. You found a new audience as you pivoted uh, and, and found people in certain areas where they were dying. They live in these cities because they want culture and content and entertainment. And then for New Yorkers and folks in San Francisco and so on, it's just so unnatural for us to sit in our little tiny, really expensive apartments all the time we we live for i live near lincoln center and to see lincoln center dark for a year just about a year now is it's it's like are they turning this into condos or something what's happening it's just it's un it's unbelievable so i'm glad you were able to do that and, and, and connect with people and uh we were talking about the hands and you had mentioned before that yes the hands are the are are the craft uh, that it was a story where you were 
out doing these activities when we used to do activities and you got injured and you hurt one of the hands. What happened there and how did you recover from that and get back on the road? It was like January, 2018. I was uh, snowboarding with one of my friends and we, uh, I'd gone off of a jump. And as I landed off the jump, uh, put my hand forward and essentially dislo- like dislocated my wrist so bad. Like I broke my wrist and dislocated oh. it so badly I needed to have surgery. So, oh. so for that, and I think immediately as I felt it break, it got real for me because I thought of, for my first thought is why did I go off of a jump when I'm a professional magician <laughs> and I need my hand? And I had, yeah. I mean, this I didn't have- A whole different kind of trick. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I had I had a lot of shows planned too. It wasn't like it was a dead month. I mean, I had just booked maybe twelve things in the next month. So, and all all out of you know New England, Florida, just moving around a lot too. So, um, so after I had the surgery and stuff, I essentially the first thing I did, I picked up a deck of cards with I broke my left wrist. I picked up a deck of cards with my right hand, and I spent five hours the first day just seeing, okay, what are some card tricks and moves I can do with one hand? And are you and righty or lefty? I'm a right hand. I'm righty. So okay. it helped, but you know, I, I learned how to, okay, there's a two of hearts on the table. You know, I, I learned how to change it with one hand basically. Oh. Um, but yeah, it was, it was pretty tough to, uh, to like travel with a broken wrist and, I wore a long sleeve to cover it up so that the audiences didn't know that my wrist was broken. Cause um, I, I still could use it a little bit. Like I could pinch with two fingers like this, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, I couldn't pick anything up. So it'd be a little thing when I brought a volunteer on stage, I'd say, Hey, why don't you move that chair over? <laughs> yeah. You look like a strong young man. Can you move that chair, please? Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. It was, it was moments like that. And a lot of the tricks are restructured to where I say, hey, instead of me doing a trick for you, how about you do a trick for me? There's a deck <laughs> of cards on the table. Think of any card and turn over the top card. And whatever they thought about would be on top. Oh, okay. That was like Once one of again, the see, you were pivoting before pivoting was even a thing. <laughs> My life is pivoting because I'm, I'm really disorganized. And so I'm always having to improvise and adapt i think it's helped me though uh, but yeah i've always been pivoting and sort of i never bank on anything being forever you know so well look it was if it was the right hand it would have been a lot worse and you might have had to cancel some shows because also people want to when we used to shake hands that was a thing in 2018 so people would want to shake hands with you or do meet and greets after the show uh and the right hand would have been worse for so many reasons you're right-handed people want to shake it now you can just get away with doing the fist bump, whatever. And you're right-handed, so then you couldn't even endorse the check afterwards. I think in 2018, people are still writing paper checks. So you would have, I'm sure you, were, you said you're working with a lot of schools. So I'm sure the schools like to pay by traditional check method and so on. And they want to wait till the work is done until they pay you and approve of your content and all that type of stuff. Yeah, so I mean, if, yeah, had I broken my right wrist, yeah, I wouldn't have been able to sign, although I could have had someone forge my signature. But then I would have been committing fraud. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> uh, was, yes, this left hand is going to have to go to jail here. Uh, it yeah, was signing. So, yeah, I'm very thankful it was my left hand. I did think about that quite a bit, that uh, I hold a deck of cards in my right hand. So 80% of things I was still able to do. I can still shuffle a deck of cards one-handed, cut it. Um, but yeah, I would have preferred to just not break anything. But it it, it taught me a lot uh, about, you know, okay, maybe I can't be as crazy as I think I am if I want to take my magic career seriously. Because <laughs> just like that, it can all go away, you know? <laughs> yeah, and you said that you had to wear long sleeves, which I'm sure some people see a magician in long sleeves. They're like, mm-hmm, he's got cards up there. But more importantly than that, the people that you're working for at the schools, corporate events, whatever, when you showed up and they saw that on your hand, were they like, uh, how are you going to do magic with a broken wrist? I, yeah, the first, I was at a, the first place I performed with it, I believe, I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure it was, um, 
it was a, a conference. It was like these college booking conferences called NACA. And mm -hmm. the yeah, I I, uh, I wore long sleeve like baseball tee or whatever. Uh -huh. And you could still see on my hand, you would see a little thing over my hand. And I, I asked this girl, just, you know, I said, hey, just real quick, just casually said, did, did you notice I had this? She goes, oh, I thought you had carpal tunnel or something from doing car trips. Yeah. She, so had, it's she sort had of, sympathy for you. Yeah. So, I mean, it's sort of, I guess as an artist, it's just so, as a magician too, they just thought it was this quirky, weird thing. It's like, oh, I guess he, he busts his ass so much with cards that his hand is needs that. <laughs> I don't know. No one really questioned it, to be honest. Um, and from far away, too, people didn't notice. But yeah, as far as like, I don't think anyone really questioned it the way I thought. And just like a magic trick, you know, with, uh, like if you do a magic trick where you vanish off stage and you appear in the back of the room, you can be walking right by people and that you think everyone's going to notice you walking through the theater and not a single person will notice you. And it's bizarre. So same thing with the wrist. I thought everyone would notice. Not a single person did. The few, they just thought I had carpal tunnel. They're weird. so focused on the thing that's happening on stage or the thing that's happening with the cards or whatever that they, everything else is oblivious around them. Um, and then fast forward, because uh, you are healed now. And then once you were healed, I saw that you recently did a TED Talk. But what yeah. was the TED Talk all about? How did that come about? Did you... Do you reach out to Ted or you're like, Ted, it's Hayden. Uh, I'd love to do a talk. Or do they come to you to say, we saw your act. We'd love if you came and talked to us about live events, about illusion and so on. So my Ted talk was on interactive performance. It was an idea okay. I thought about a lot, like making, uh, just engaging people and making things interactive. And it, it was as simple as, you know, I pitched it to TEDx Charlotte where I was living or where I live and I auditioned with it. I told them the outline of what I wanted. And I think they just said, okay, that's pretty unique. We'd like to do it. They did say they didn't originally, I wanted to just do a magic act because I'd uh -huh. seen that. And they said, no, we, we had that in the past. We want uh, you to just talk about this idea. So, um, it was a unique experience. I don't know that I'll do it again uh, anytime soon, but yeah, my, my TED talk was just about, you know, like we were saying, rather than doing a card trick where you just sit and stare at me, do a trick. Uh, it's sort of talking about why I find it important that, you know, we interact with each other, that a card <laughs> trick is about the experience you and I have together, the journey more so than what I'm doing. And so by making it interactive, I'm able to compete with TV, Netflix, and stuff like that, because especially it's, it's really relevant now in the digital age. If I do something that requires you to give input, like if I said, think of any card, you know, it requires you to do something with, which like a movie or TV show, it doesn't care, right? It's just on, you just sit and stare at it. So I've structured my shows to where, you know, okay, everyone has to be there and really get involved for you to enjoy it. Um, and yeah, that, that's basically what that was about. Oh, that's amazing. I uh -huh. saw another TED Talk, another magic TED Talk, or should I say, I should say a TED Talk on magic. It wasn't that magical. But anyway, the magician said that there are three, three elements to every trick, misdirection, chant, and illusion. Now, is that a hard and fast rule? Or is that just to add suspense and distract people from what's really happening? I, I mean, I'd say there are no hard and steadfast rules in magic. I'd say that there is, what do you say, misdirection, chance, and illusion? Yes. Misdirection, chant, and, chant, uh, and illusion. Was it chance or chant? I thought it was chant, like C-H-A-N-T, like we are going. We are going. Like, uh, just, yeah, I would. Yeah. I would think it would be chance. Like something I couldn't think of really... any other chant right there. That was not <laughs> a real. That was like the worst chant. We are not going. Oh uh, no, it's all good. No, I mean, I'd, I, I can't tell you off the. I I think there is more to that misdirection, chance or chant and illusion. Um, but I, I, if I had to guess, I would say that was sort of the outline, maybe for what he was performing. But you know, there's a lot of different kinds of magic. I, hmm, yeah, I'm trying to think of something maybe that would break that. I'm thinking, 
Okay, something levitating is illusion. Misdirection, I'd say mo pretty much everything is misdirection in my opinion. Um, chance, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I guess I would say that covers ninety nine percent of it. Maybe I could think of some of that. <laughs> I, I guess the chat could even be like on the count of three. Open yeah, your eyes. I, well, I guess if it's chant, but see, chant. I don't think you need chant. You can do a. a I mean, Teller from Penn and Teller doesn't say anything when he performs. So, <laughs> That's you true. know, I don't think. But maybe he only does misdirection and illusion. Uh, so I don't know. Um, I would say that the, they're. That's probably mostly true. I think we can always find a rule I did to, or an exception to that rule. I can't think of anything, but I like to challenge the status quo. That to me sometimes is what magic is about. Uh, in my opinion, you know, uh, it's foundation. It's about uh, deception and mental or cognitive uh, dissonance. That's okay. what intrigues me, you know, but I don't know. I have to think about that. Well, mental and cognitive dissonance and all of that, uh, is there a big difference between a magician and a mentalist or do most people do both of those things? Depends on who you talk to sometimes. I mean, I'll tell you like mental mentalism is a style of magic. Okay. It, I mean, it's, it's magic that involves psychology. So at the end of the day, it's still a magic trick. I think that there are some mentalists who like to, in my opinion, deceive and lie and say that they have some kind of special gift and that's how they're able to read minds. But at the end of the day, it's, it's giving the illusion of, you know, someone saying that they're reading your mind. No, they're giving you the illusion of that. Mm -hmm. um, so mentalism is a style of magic. All mentalism is magic. Not all magic is mentalism, you know, <laughs> but it is amazing. I mean, is it just very basic stuff? Like they go to an event for a, for a corporate event and they realize, well, everybody is at this company, they're, according to their profile of the company, they're all kind of like-minded. So, and they all live in the New York area. So you can kind of keep things general to that. You, and you're talking about for like a, a mentalist? Yeah, like for like, for like a mentalist, like it's sometimes you're like, how did they know this about me? Or I, I'm not asking you to give away the secrets. I wouldn't do that unless you want to, but. <laughs> It's, it, is it that's, there's got to be some preparation to it. It's not like you just wake up and get there and you're like, okay, where are we? We're in, we're in Charlotte. Okay. We're at the Bank of America conference, not a sponsor of the program here, but, uh, and then they just, it's, there's got to be some kind of background information that they at least study if they don't get it directly from HR or something like that. Well, you, you'd actually be amazed. I mean, there's some really impressive people that, um, can just walk into a room, no preparation. And the, now I will say like most mentalists are not gonna, uh, cause that starts pushing into maybe the realm of like psychics and fortune tellers. You know, a lot of them won't reveal, um, well, that's not true. A lot of them will reveal something <laughs> personal, but, but you know, they're not going to come in and say y earlier today, you drove a green truck, didn't you? Mm. What? No, they're not going to do something like that. <laughs> How did you a lot of it. Yeah, a lot of them may walk, you know, a typical mentalism thing may say, you know, if you were to think of any place in the world that you could travel to, get that place in your mind, focus on it, imagine it here on stage, and they draw something, and it ends up being the Eiffel Tower because they thought about Paris, right? Um, and those people are just very talented at guiding your, again, it is a form of magic because they're misdirecting you, controlling your attention, Yeah. and... Uh, essentially controlling the way that you might think or anticipating how you might think. And I mean, those people, yeah, no prep. They're, they're just very talented at controlling that. And some of the, I mean, I've talked to people who just, they just practiced it enough and learned that people um, are just predictable in some ways and the, uh, they form patterns with how people think. It's really cool. Um, they should all be in sales. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of them could be really good salesmen. I mean, honestly, I think that they went into uh, magic mentalism because it's more fun. Uh, they're, yeah. you know, they're theatrical, yeah. you know, but yeah, I mean, I've even had, I've had salespeople, a uh, company, they say, Hey, we, you know, can you teach our sales team tactics on how we can boost numbers and stuff? And, um, you know, first off I say, okay, I want you to keep in mind, 
this is these are magic tricks at yeah. the end of the day uh right these are just magic tricks and anyone who can tell you that they will do it otherwise is kind of lying um i mean there may be some nothing you can't get in a psychology book right uh you'd be better off talking to a psychologist or someone who specializes in that because a mentalist will tell you how to give the illusion of it but right i don't know i i'd actually think you'd probably be better talking to some behavioral economic psychologist about yeah. it or something <laughs> Uh, yeah for someone in sales probably <laughs> yeah then they open up their books they're like we're in the red pretty badly this year can you do some magic on this you're like i'm out of here this is turning into a madoff situation i've got to go um <laughs> yeah, so you gotta be you can only do so much magic and you're like look your sales force isn't very talented a card trick is not gonna uh turn the tide here you guys are in real trouble it's like, yeah yeah this is out of my i'll give you the i can help you make it look like you're not <laughs> yeah. broke I'm going to be really uh, good at that. <laughs> yeah, I could do a magic trick where I could just remove them all from the building because they stink and you can just hire new people because that's probably the better thing that you could do. Um, so is there like, I know there, there, there could be magic festivals, but there's got to be some sort of big trade show for magic. Do you ever go to anything like this? You, you were talking about earlier that um, you started getting hired for events by going to one of these trade show type things. Yeah, there's um there's a lot of magic conventions and you know not so many now, but uh, <laughs> there's a huge one out in Las Vegas called Magic Live, and all the magicians from all over the world, some of the best of the best, um, you know, all show up to this convention in Las Vegas, and occasionally you'll see you know some famous ones pop in like David Copperfield, one time you know sometimes Chris Angel, but. Uh, uh met sig or siegfried a couple of years ago from siegfried and roy yeah. so it's a really it's an i mean it's a really fantastic sort of collaborative thing when you get that many talented people all together there's just rooms where everyone's got a deck of cards out and they're all showing off for each other teaching each other things so um there's you got a lot your wallet in your front pocket the whole time <laughs> yeah well i mean I, well, that is true. I actually did know a guy who pickpocketed, and that, that was the most annoying person to hang out with, in my opinion. I, I eventually got, I got pissed. Yeah, I got you again. Him, but okay. I don't, I don't even care now. Like, uh, but, no, I mean, and there's like TED Talk style magic presentations on, hey, this, you know, uh, this is how I did this magic trick on TV. Let me show you the behind the scenes and things like that. It's really fantastic. So you're sharing best practices, but not giving away secrets. I know people will openly share secrets too. I mean, it's, we're, and the thing is, yeah, you think, why would you share secrets like that? Could any average Joe, or you, people think, would an average person walk in and learn all that? And the thing is like, people don't really care that much. The only people <laughs> who really care about a lot of magic trick secrets are other magicians. Yeah. Um, it's kind of, I always liken it to the KFC secret recipe. Everyone's like, yeah, you know, no one actually knows the secret recipe to the fried chicken. But I go, have you ever actually Googled it to find it? Because yeah. if you search it, you can actually find pr like pretty identical recipes, but yeah. no, who cares? It's like, 11 herbs and spices. Go? Right. Exactly. Yeah. So you just want to eat the chicken. You don't really care. So same thing. You don't really care about the secret that much. You just want to watch the magic trick and... Yeah, the secret's a lot of tricks you could find uh, potentially, but no one cares. So yeah, yeah, yeah I could I could go I, I could make a burger at home, but it just doesn't taste as good as it does when I go down to Lure Fish Bar in the West in the in Soho, and Chef Josh Capon makes it for me because that's the magic. That's what it's all about. It's about the experience. Mm -hmm, right. Yeah. No. I mean, most people now there are some people who you know say who who just have that crazy passion and want to learn everything and those are going to be the people who show up at these conventions anyway right so yeah. um you know the whole idea of not revealing secrets blah 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 i think is generally it's a good rule of thumb if i do a card trick for you okay i shouldn't show you how i did it because that defeats the purpose of what it did <laughs> yeah. right but i don't think there's anything wrong with writing about it in a book and publishing it for people who are into it because the people who are into it anyway you're gonna find find out one way or another, right? Uh, there's so many books on magic. I mean, I could right. do do a card trick for you, and you could go to Royal Road of Card Magic. It's a book volume. There's eight volumes. 
I don't think you'll take the time to read through all those books to figure out how I did that trick, right? So, but if you did, that'd be fine too. And say, yeah. cool. Because it actually, sometimes it makes the tricks better. And just like you're saying with the food, sometimes learning how to cook and do all that makes you appreciate food more. I mean, I sure. love cooking at home. So when I go out to a nice place, it's so much better because I know the prep work that went into it. So you appreciate it. You appreciate the art. Right. So likewise, if I do a card trick for you, um, if you knew the secret, if you actually knew the amount of work that went into doing some things, you would probably appreciate it more. Um, because oddly enough, it's, it's weird to say, but sometimes the more entertaining or the more impressive the trick, the more disappointing the secret. Yeah. So if I, I could actually show you something that you may go, oh, okay, that was okay. But it'll end up being the hardest trick to do because there's just a lot of technique and stuff that you might not care about. <laughs> so on that note, did you figure out anything else during the lockdown? Did you decide to put that passion into cooking a bit more or was there anything else you learned or did you just continue to hone your craft and get up every day and work at that? I this past year, I think I've learned more than the last two years or three years. Um, I mean, yeah, I would, I did cook at home every day. I got really good at cooking first off in that first month because restaurants were closed. So I said, I want to cook my favorite meals, but you know, magic wise, I mean, I learned, I, 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 I really learned my values, you know, um, I learned what I loved most about magic and what I didn't like. Um, well, well, did you learn that you were pretty happy working from home or you're like, I got to get back on the road? At first, um, I said, if I have to do virtual shows for the rest of the year, I'm just going to stop doing magic. Yeah. This is terrible. Eventually, I converted into the room that we're in now where it's a little easier. You know, I can cut the close ups of the cards and stuff like oh, that. Um, perfect. So I learned, you know, I really liked being able to be at home to, to say, okay, I gotta, I'm, I'm performing for someone in New York city, right? Well, I can just walk into this room, turn on the cameras and perform some great interactive magic that I think is genuinely good. Um, so you do, it, it is different though. I think what made it so tough at first is I was trying to recreate the experience of performing for people in real life when I really just had to embrace it as a whole new thing. Um, I do really miss the energy of just people kind of crowding all around me yeah. and that the energy in the room, the, you can kind of smell the alcohol in the air and people <laughs> screaming. Um, it's all the little things I miss, but I don't miss having to get up early, fly somewhere, stay in a hotel room alone, set up sound check. I mean, it was an all day event to do a show. Right. Um, and I don't miss that. <laughs> yeah. And that's like when you're, discussing your rate and everything people are like well it's only a 20 minute show or half hour show you're like i'm uh, no it's it's a full day it's and then there's preparation you're paying me for the date to lock off the date and be exclusive you're not paying me for those 30 minutes you're paying me for my time my effort my talent and most importantly nobody else gets me on february 20th blah 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 yeah i mean well it's crazy too sometimes the the way people will uh, look at pricing for like entertainment and yeah. think, oh, that's crazy. I remember I was, I was maybe 15 years old and got cussed out by a lady. I put an ad like in the newspaper. Some say, I'll do kids' birthday parties. And I was like 14, 15. <laughs> and a lady called, said, are you available today to do something? We, we, whoever canceled. And I said, sure. I think I was charging maybe $200, $150 to do a kid's birthday party. Uh -huh. And she said something like, ah, for, for uh, 45 minutes, that's more than a doctor makes in an hour. And just hung up and like cussed me out. And I yeah, said, you're like, well, then call a doctor and have him play with the stethoscope for, for two <laughs> hours while they're cutting the ice cream cake. Come on. You want a magician or not? Well, it was, yeah, it was, just, well, it was just bizarre to see that they think, oh, I'm thinking of the... They're, they're thinking, oh, how much is it per hour rather than, okay, right. the cost. Like, it's not like I'm doing 40 hours of birthday parties when I'm 14. <laughs> like, yeah. it's, it's my Saturday afternoon. I'm showing up. But um, Well, I'm sure you're not doing kids' birthday parties anymore. No. But how can we find out perhaps how to book you or how can we find out more about you? 
I know you're not an Instagram magic guy, but I'm sure you've got the Instagram, uh, as the cool kids call it. So how do we find out more about Hayden? You can check out my website. It's HaydenIsMagic.com. And all my social media is Hayden is magic. So, I mean, I put some things on Instagram, but not a whole ton. I mean, the best way to experience it is just to get a ticket whenever things open and see me. Um, but I hope this is an interesting interview. I hope I was able to give some fun insight and stories. <laughs> you were absolutely. We appreciate it. And look, he's going to be performing magic near you soon all over the country. And we're back to live events because we can't wait. We love the energy of the audience and the audience loves the energy that you're giving out there from you, from comedians, from musicians, all performers. Uh, we are going to vanish right now, but we promise we will be back next time. We will reappear, so to speak, next time on Festival Past Stories. Hayden, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. This is Festival Past Stories, a podcast series is told by the people who create and make festivals come to life. You will go behind the stage, kitchen, or studio door to hear the stories of passion and inspiration that started some of the world's most beloved festivals. Hear the startup stories and how an idea went from what if to what's next. Yeah.